He was the leader of Japan who brought his nation from active conflict with China to global war in 1941. But he was not, as he is sometimes portrayed, an authoritarian dictator like his ally Adolf Hitler. So who was Hideki Tojo? Welcome to a World War II in real time bio special where I take a closer look at the major or interesting figures of the war, today featuring Hideki Tojo. There are, in fact, a bunch of differences between Tojo and his European Axis counterparts. Tojo was appointed as Prime Minister by Emperor Hirohito, the traditional way, in October 1941. But there were no constitutional changes made that solidified or extended his power. He was not the leader of any mass popular movement, and there aren't any real ideologies you associate him with. He didn't have anything like total power even holding multiple offices and cabinet posts simultaneously. And though he was both army minister and prime minister, he certainly did not control the Japanese Navy. And the war with the Western powers being fought across the Pacific Ocean meant the Navy being pretty important. In spite of this, he was the strongest prime minister in modern Japanese history, and the extent of his power was considerable, though as it turned out, fragile. Tojo Hideki was born in 1884 in Tokyo, the son of a lieutenant general in the Imperial Japanese Army. Following in his father's footsteps, he attended both the military academy and the Army Staff College, finishing the latter in 1915. He did serve briefly, as the Great War was ending, in the Japanese Expeditionary Force sent to try to intervene in the Russian Civil War, but was then sent to Europe as a military attaché to Germany and Switzerland. Tojo was intellectually influenced by the elements within the German army that wished to plan for a next war by creating a totalitarian defense state. This would be the national defense state much of the Imperial Japanese army would later support. In terms of personality, he was very strict, very unbending, and with a meticulous attention to detail. His only hobby was his work. While he was never known for being especially bright, he very much did distinguish himself as a diligent administrator. Later in the 1930s, he would pick up the nickname Kamisori, Razor, for his strictness. From 1922 to 26, he taught at the Staff College, then spent three years with the Army Ministry, and then commanded an infantry regiment. It was during this period that the by then Colonel Tojo began to really take an interest in the politics of the army and militarist politics in general. He then spent three years with the general staff and then Major General Hideki Tojo commanded the 34th Infantry Brigade in 1934 and 35. That year, he became commander of the military police, the Kenpai, of the Kwantung Army in Manchukuo. You may remember that Manchukuo is the Japanese puppet state in Manchuria they set up in 1932. The Kwandong Army was the largest army group in the Imperial Japanese Army, and it was they who orchestrated the invasion of Manchuria in 1931 without any orders from the Japanese government. Like in other parts of the world, Japan had a serious boom in ultra-nationalism in the 20s and 30s, and radicals within the army really wanted to install a military dictatorship as Japan's government. The 30s saw planned coups and a bunch of assassinations, but once the rebellion in February 1936 was put down, those hardliners in the army instead chose to, to gradually penetrate and manipulate the government to achieve their ends. They were helped in this, as was the Navy, that year by the arrangement that the army and Navy ministers in the cabinet had to be on active duty, not reserves. So they could make any cabinet fall by just not giving it a minister or withdrawing one. But back to Tojo, who was rising to the top of the army during all of this. In 1937, he became chief of staff of the Kwandung Army. And as any schoolboy knows, that summer Japan invaded China. Two things. One, that invasion saw Tojo's only actual combat experience when he led two brigades into Inner Mongolia. And two, Tojo very much believed that only a strong, overwhelming show of force could bring China to collaborate and cooperate with Japan, or should I say under Japan, in a greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere, which aimed to end American and European imperialism in East Asia. 
That sounds maybe okay until you realize that many, though by no means all, in the Japanese high command thought that the populations of East Asia were their inferiors and wanted to replace Western imperialism with their own and as violently as need be. Tojo was opposed in the idea of a full-on war with China by Ishiwara Kanji, the vice chief of staff of the Kwandong army. He was one of the main orchestrators of the Manchuria invasion, but did not think the war a wise idea and denounced the Kwandong leadership. Tojo had him relieved of his duties and transferred, but when Ishiwara made public speeches denouncing the war in China and called Tojo an enemy of Japan who should be arrested and executed, Tojo had him put on the retired list. That's in 1939. I'm not there yet. In May 1938, Hideki Tojo became army vice minister in Prince Konoye's cabinet. Well, his first cabinet. Seishiro Itagaki was the minister, and the two of them opposed any sort of compromise or peace deal with Chiang Kai-shek, leader of the Chinese Nationalist Army. That cabinet fell in January 1939, but when Konoye formed his second cabinet in July 1940, Tojo was appointed army minister, and he would remain in that post in Konoye's third cabinet in 1941. Now, as cabinet minister, he had a lot more influence. He was a big proponent of signing the tripartite pact with Germany and Italy after Germany's spectacular victories in Europe, and Japan did so in September 1940. Japan also took the opportunity that summer to send troops into French Indochina, but it was the summer of 1941 that Tojo's influence really took off. He talked the cabinet into occupying, well, invading, the southern parts of Indochina, which prompted the US to tighten their economic thumbscrews to the point of total embargo. Japan was by then very much in need of things like oil, rubber, and tin. And Tojo was very much for taking the British and Dutch colonial possessions in Southeast Asia that had formerly supplied them, knowing full well this could likely mean war with the U.S. In fact, as I talk about in the regular episodes, the Imperial Conference on September 6, 1941 confirmed what had been decided at the Liaison Conference the day before, that Japan would go to war with everyone if a solution didn't arise before mid-October. Well, Konoye was not in favor of a war and certainly didn't want to lead it, but he was not in a good position, though he tried and failed to get a summit with American Secretary of State Cordell Hull. Konoye figured he could make a deal and present his nation with a fait accompli that would circumvent the war hawks. Hull didn't trust Japan at all in general and didn't think Konoye could make any decision reached stick so there was no summit. Hull was also adamant that the base conditions for any agreement would be Japan committing to pulling out of Indochina and China. Konoye pleaded several times with Tojo to do this, but Tojo was as adamant as Hull that it was not going to happen. When Konoye resigned as prime minister in October 1941, and Emperor Hirohito appointed Tojo in his place, the cards had fallen. It would be war. Sure, there were still overtures and proposals in November, but that was window dressing. When Hull wrote, mostly restating, conditions for resumption of trade on November 26, Tojo used the Hull note as his official pretext for war, though his decision had already been made. Attacks would commence December 8th all over Southeast Asia on Malaya, Thailand, Singapore, Hong Kong, and more, and on American possessions, the Philippines, Wake Island, Guam, and the U.S. fleet at anchor at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Because of the time difference, it would still be December 7th in Hawaii. Tojo's response to Hull was to be delivered that morning, half an hour before the Japanese carrier fleet attacked Pearl. As it turned out, it was nearly six hours late. It was still not, however, a declaration of war. The Japanese attacks in 1941 and 1942 did conquer most of Southeast Asia, and so was created the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. The co part is a bit misleading since it was Japan that saw the benefits of conquest. Tojo was prime minister, army minister, and even home minister for the first four months of his cabinet. In that capacity, 
He sought to get rid of opposition by having leftists and liberals arrested. He put strict controls on the economy, the press, and most public or political organizations. But he did not proclaim a state of emergency to take legislative power. The Diet would continue to function. In April 1942, he called for a general election and the government recommended candidates to be elected. But perhaps surprisingly, some independent candidates were elected. Some of them refused to join the Imperial Rule Assistance Political Association, a successor to a similar organization formed in 1940 that had replaced political parties. Long story. But though centralization proceeded during Tojo's reign, he had to lead a wartime coalition of Japan's various competing elites just to govern, and his ability to dictate to other ministers or imperial headquarters was limited. And as I said, he had no control over the Navy and thus over the competition between Army and Navy for resources. To try to solve that, in November 1943, he created the Ministry of Munitions and made himself minister. But it wasn't a real solution. It became evident that his position was not all that secure either as the war began to go against Japan. In February 1944, he assumed the post of Army Chief of Staff while Navy Minister Shimada became Navy Chief of Staff to try to set up some form of unified military command and to run campaigns personally. But this opened him up to all sorts of criticism. A coalition of his opponents pushed for his resignation that summer after further setbacks in the field. Unable to either placate or intimidate them, on the 18th of July, Hideki Tojo resigned all of his posts, as did the rest of his cabinet. I'll say right now that if Tojo, with all his posts and powers, was unable to control the Japanese war effort, General Kosio Kuniaki, who replaced him only as Prime Minister, was certainly not going to be able to either. Tojo's resignation was not because of any sort of coup. It was the same constitutional way he came to power. He was not arrested, nor was he even denounced. He retired to live the quiet life of a former Prime Minister. Some Japanese officers committed suicide when Japan surrendered in 1945. Tojo did not. Then, when American MPs came to arrest him, he shot himself in the chest, but he didn't die. He was tried for war crimes and found guilty and hanged in December 1948. This didn't exactly inspire sympathy for him, either at home or abroad. He was widely seen in Japan as responsible for the war, which to a pretty fair extent he was. His reign was oppressive, though he only had some 2,500 political prisoners detained, which does not compare at all with the scale of, say, the Gestapo or the NKVD, for whatever that's worth. And he had not done the honorable thing and committed suicide. Too many, though. Tojo's legacy was the leader who presided over a host of crimes against humanity committed by the Japanese military on his watch or his authorization. Starvation, massacres, rapes, murders, forced labor of civilians and POWs were all committed by the army that Tojo led with a death toll in the millions. And for all that he led Japan into a war that many of his colleagues knew Japan could not win, he could still never overcome the bureaucratic and governmental hurdles required to have the power to streamline the war effort and the economy and his reign was ultimately one of frustration. If you'd like to learn more about Japan's interwar political and military situation, you can click here for our Between Two Wars episode about that. And please support our war effort at timegoes.tv or patreon.com. It is your support that allows us to do this in the first place. See you next time. Mm -hmm.